Thanks so much. Thanks, Christina. And thanks, Chloe, and thanks to everyone who's uh, been a part of putting this together and for coming. It's a little, um, I don't know if it's early for a reading or late for a reading, but um, I'm glad you're here. Um, what I'm going to do is try to keep this short and sweet. I'll read um, a bit from the ground and then also uh, a bit from uh, the manuscript Heaven, which will come out, I guess, at the beginning of next year. Um, and I'm really happy with those poems, and I'm really looking forward to taking them out for a walk. So um, thanks, for your, uh, thanks for your patience with those. All right, so I'm going to read one more poem. <laughs> I told you, short and sweet. Tonight, <clears throat> in the beginning was this surface, a wall, a beginning. Tonight, it coaxed music from a Harlem cloud bank. It freestyled a smoke from a stranger's throat. It stole thinned gin. It was at the edge of its beginnings, but outside, looking in. The lapse blue facade of Harlem Hospital is weather still, like a starlit lake midst Lenox Avenue. Tonight, I touched the tattooed skin of the building I was born in. And because tonight is curing, the beginning let me through. And everywhere was blurring halogen. Love the place that welcomed you. Terra incognita. I plugged my poem into a manhole cover that flamed into the first guitar, jarred the asphalt and tar to ash, and made from where there once was ground a sound instead to stand on. A vision through the smoke. A tree, half a flame, moaned inside me. The willow that had wept would not weep. All of me, the pigeons cried, all of me. Or is it all of you, all of you, that they cooed? The skyline held the sun up like two carnival strongmen, but then seemed to drop with the greatest of ease. No eye I knew could clear the clouding mirror. Not the sun as it set, nor the moon as it bruised. Golden. For once, I slept and you watched. I dreamed, I think. I washed without my hands. You watched. I moved along a scratchy plain of dandelion, peony, wild and luckless clover. A bee entered me. You soothed my ache. We watched a golden sky heckled into slate. I will wake and say, golden. I will wake and say, no, nothing but that. I had become the injurer who makes things golden swimming in your voice so much deeper than mine. Marin Cognito. Since this poem is about my mother, it's kind of fitting to have a dramatic entrance, right? Mm. 
mare incognitum that I can't recall my first glimpse of my mother, alien-eyed, wrapped in alien cloth. How could I? Once she held me, she just was my mother. That's just how it goes. This is just one of many beautiful moments I've been a part of, but can't and won't ever remember. That's just life, I guess. The void. That's just a part of life. Some hidden cave sunk deep in the mind and built for beautiful, but can't remember. I saw it once, here dissolving, there reassembling like gleaned second long seasons. And for what reason, I just don't know. Years asking myself, why, why can we not remember this past? Are we here because the mere dust of stars torched in the throat of an equation? It's a cold thought, I know. But belief just burns brighter in the cold. Brighter as the first idea flares and reverses, like the first new motion of that first majestic ocean, just as it discovered impregnable ground. Proper names in the lyrics of Troubadours. My parents never call me Rowan. I'm Ricky from Ricardo, but not Ricky Ricardo. <laughs> I'm also the first Phillips in my family. My mother decided Philip, my father's family name, sounded too much like a first name, in America at least. Rowan Philip would lead inevitably to Philip Rowan. That was her story, and she's sticking to it. For the record, that's an Old Norse first name, a Spanish middle name, and one of those faux English, faux Dutch sounding last names that's really Greek for lover of horses. Rowan Ricardo Phillips. Another of those names that straddle seas in the sails of unseen ships. Still, it sounds typically West Indian to me. And like the West Indies, indefinite. An indefinite noun in an indefinite poem. It took me a while to accept it. Embrace the night and get thee gone. Talking picture, silent poem, New York shakes off the fall. Tonight, I work in a silence that prays the rare turn to sound. I make nothing. I am fractured. I walk in the dark egg of another September night that is cool, that is cool as though the moon is a mouth that blows on its wound. We are early in the life of the poet. He knows so little of light, so little of shadow. 
He knows downtown as a metaphor. He knows the constellations are at work tonight, whoring their stories of strife. A poem's in search of its body. He is in search of life. Down toward the river, the skyline broaches its phalanx of broken teeth. And up above, in the grounded sky, the sky grinds down the stars. And up above, in the grounded sky, the sky grinds down. The stars broach its phalanx of broken teeth. The skyline toward the river searches for its body, downed, dammed up, beached, like the end of a poem walled up against competitive life. The constellations are at work tonight. Beetlegeist, Bellatrix, the hunter's bow in elegy graffitied across the endless black gate. We know so little of light, it dies though we are early in its life. A beautiful night, its lambent moon lets down a light that only happens in September. Say it, September. Fragile as an egg now, teetering, parabolic, broken teeth in the mouth that praise the rare turn to sound. I work through the silence. Tonight, New York shakes off the fall. Silent poem, talking picture. Embrace the night and get thee gone. I'm going to read um, one more poem from the ground. Um, I think I'll read the, uh, the translation. Uh, I translated the 26th Canto of Purgatorio um, for a magazine, uh, Italian to English, and I liked it, but when you translate, you know, you end up with all these other versions in your head, right? All these other possibilities that you don't choose, right? So translation is also about election. It's not just that, oh, well, this word means this word, or this sentence means this sentence. Um, so, you know, I finished the translation, I sent it off. They loved it, I was happy with that. And I went to sleep. But you have these intuitive um, engines in your imagination that often aren't happy with what you're happy with. Um, and I dreamed another translation. Um, and I woke up and I wrote it down. And I kept a part of it. Um, and this is that part, Purgatorio. 26 lines 135 to 148. Uh, you know, this is the this is the slice also of the Purgatorio that ends up in Eliot's wasteland. Basically, Dante's almost at the top of Mount Purgatorio, and so the the most almost blessed shades are there. And uh, at this moment, he loses Virgil. Virgil points to him, uh, points out to him, uh, the greatest poet of them all, the troubadour are not Danielle. And Danielle says a few words to him before he ascends up to paradise. Um, what's really moving about that in the original is that it's the only moment in the comedy where Dante writes in another language. There are other moments in the, in the comedy where you have maybe gibberish, you know, that papi Satan, papi Satan, all of that. But this is the only moment where another language breaks the Tuscan Italian of Dante. And, you know, he was in exile, so his language meant everything to him. And it's just a great sign of ultimate love and respect to another poet to kind of fall into that language. Um, very moving. And uh, so here's my, uh, here's my translation. Purgatorio 26, 135 to 148. There's an epigraph in the Provençal of uh, Daniel. It goes, Io sui or no, cablao ival cantan. So you see, I am or not, who cries and goes on singing.
he was gone. Like a leap of flame that after having burst from the sun is dragged back into the sun as though nothing, leaving only the seen surface of the sun. I'd lost my way. I had no guide but a light, the slowly approaching twilight. And I said, light be this world. And I said, world be this light. And slowly, a bright star field fell to the sea fell all about the one my guide had pointed out. And he said, Rastaman, I am on. <laughs> Angel seven C. No. but I smell some of the smoke of Babylon on I. Come closer. Closer. So I man have some ital veneration. I am Bob, who weep and strum and gather and love all ting little and small. Ja left I lung and guitar to sing to everyone, all them, but I now know ting but what I sing. And I now want no ting. I now want no ting. So when I complete I uphill chapters, and I uphill trip to I, sing some of I soul you see here so close, peeled from I man structure. Sing of somebody dread in I, so I and I and I find it so easy, love Bob dead. Then he fled as the lion that defined him. And, um, I'll read some, some poems from, from heaven. I think they're all in blank verse. I think they are, they are. No, one of them is actually in tetrameter. The mind after everything has happened. Perpetual peace, perpetual light. From a distance, it all seems graffiti, gold on gold, iridescent torqued phosphors, but still graffiti. Someone's smear on space, a name, a neighborhood, X. X was here, X in the house, a two-handed engine of aerosols hissing, thou shalt not pass on fiery ground. A shot down aurora borealis that raised aureola at the tip of the tongue of I or thou. Benedict Robinson, text me if you know. If hell is a crater, to a crater, to a crater, to a crater, what then is heaven, aside from its opposite, which was glorious, known, and obvious? Um, in the Odyssey, there's that famous Nicoya, right? Uh, Odysseus has to go down to hell to get some answers. 
And in Hades, he sees people who are very happy to see him because they can tell him, they can te he can tell them what's going on in the world above. Achilles could find out about his son, etc. Um, I've basically written a reverse Nequia. So basically, I translated lines 538 to 556, but I said it in heaven, which actually makes everything very um, strange for a number of reasons, not just locationally, but there's no heaven for them. The Odyssey, Book 11, lines 538 to 556. You asked for it. The soul of swift-souled Achilles, hearing me praise his son, silvered and then was gone, his long strides causing him to blend light bent into the shining maize meadow cloud bank, shadowed by that one solitary tree it takes 16 years for light, let alone a soul to cross. The other dead, who thrived though they had died, rejoiced at seeing me and sang one by one to me. And I in turn said back to one after the other that the song that soul sang was a blessing and that I had never heard anything like it, which was true, but also, I must admit, they bored me to tears. <laughs> tears that their surprisingly still finite knowledge took as tears of pure joy from hearing them sing. Only Ajax Telemoniades kept away, arms crossed, refusing to speak, dim-starred and disappearing into his rage all because of a simple spar of words, a mere speech, and winning Achilles' armor. Athena above and those men at the ships decided that, not me. Although it's true, he never stood a chance. By custom, he should have been given the matchless medal. How I wish I hadn't won that contest how the ground closed over his head for it. What a fool I can be. Ajax, who knew no equal in action but for the one man who surpassed him, just fled Achilles, so capable of happiness despite all that happened because he washed up here, heaven this implausible place for us. Strange that Ajax is also in heaven, despite ending his legendary life. In the end, he's won, but he doesn't seem to understand that he's won. Poor Ajax. As always, I thought I had winning words. And so I said to him, with unreturned gaze. Son of great Telamon, mighty Ajax, war tower, shake free of your anger. There's no one to blame but Zeus, and look, he's no longer here, friend. Paradise has found you and given you an eternal roof under the one tree of high heaven. Zeus treated us so terribly, and you, whom he should have loved like his strongest son, you worst of all. But that's history now. Come, my strong brother, Lord, and deserved winner of all Achilles' war and was. Come be with us here. Let me hear the light of heaven in your voice. And let me know, because I love you, how you, of all men, ended up in the keen of this endless burn. 
But Ajax, gift died, said nothing to me, and took his seat under the rowan tree. I'm just going to read two more poems. I'm about to drop a man I'm getting old poem on you sorry <laughs> sorry but I am getting old don't worry you guys are not getting old it's just me I'm the only one here getting old the rest of you are all set don't worry boys we'd cut school like knives through butter the three of us Peter Stephen and I to play just about all the music we knew, which meant that from nine in the morning till Steve's parents, the ever patient Murtovs, would get home from work, I played the guitar. Steve played bass. Oh, I just misread that. Now I have to start over. That's the first time. I've heard. Yeah, yeah, that is kind of interesting. You're gonna cut that out, right? <laughs> Boys. We cut school like knives through butter, the three of us, Peter, Stephen, and I, to play just about all the music we knew, which meant that from nine in the morning till Steve's parents, the ever patient Murtaugh's, would get home from work, I played guitar, Peter played bass, and Steve, who'd end up becoming a guitarist by trade when we went separate ways to separate schools in separate states, Steve, at this point, played the drums. We dreamed of power trios and powered our way through song after song, including one Steve and I wrote, like, Hey Regina, and the lamentably titled, String Her Up. Sometimes we tried out some yes, a long, hey Joe. The stereo phaser was my signature sound, and I'd bend in and out of notes imply arpeggios only to soul over them, tapped, frowned through anything in a major key, felt my way home on Steve's map of snares, Pete's rope. We'd play an entire Zeppelin album, usually the first or second, then stray by chance into the longer, later songs, like bees that float down and drown in a pool. We'd break for lunch, and then get back at it as though we had a gig to get ready for, a demo to cut. The cassette deck rolling its eyes as it whirred round and round. Peter, as is the nature of bassists, held the tunes together and kept things light. Years later, I assumed he was dead. My Telecaster glares at me at night now from the hard case by my bed. And the calluses on my fingertips have long since softened. The six minute solos at some point became poems. It took two months minimum to make seem seamless. Steve, in the meantime, thrived in the triangle, became Stevie, Married Emily. Pete, I know less about. He posts on Facebook cheerfully about the light, the great light that glows in all of us. Sends the occasional white dove in the occasional shared shot. A sun resting on a cloud like a pearl in its mooted gray shell. Nostalgia courts me. I'm nearing 40. We were boys. And I should let us be. But nostalgia spreads quickly through the ashes of our youth, making ferned fires out of blue beliefs. When the dark would come, 
we'd show each other our blisters, the painful white whorls peeling, our red palms upwards, outstretched and unread. And um, I'm going to end with a poem, a title you might you might recognize. Um, but I, I really believe um, one of the strengths of the era that we live in, the, the generation of all of you guys, is that you live in an era of remixes, right? And real kind of B-sides and everything. And you should, and sequels and remakes, and you should really embrace that and take that to heart. So the title of this poem is Never Again Would Bird Song Be the Same. Never again would bird song be the same. Eight floors below our wide open window, as early summer sang to early dawn and no breeze blew, a car crouched idling under a red traffic light that had spent most of the night with nothing in sight but the rare cab or bus. We only knew the car was there by the boom of its quaking bass, a sudden sound that stirred us from deep sleep. Her face facing mine, my face lost in hers. We slept like the lines of a villanelle, apart, together, woven into one. I got up and went to the window. For some reason, the mind can't seem to rest until it's seen what it's heard and defines it. So I looked out and down, and the car was half gone by then. It was a cop car. I still wonder if this really happened, if it matters in the greater scheme of things. Is a poem the wonder or the matter? Later, as she and I started our day, coffee, the paper, a shower, she asked if I'd caught where that music had come from. It should have been funny, but we felt dread. Months passed, then years, and I still have that song in my head. The first thump that woke us up like a swarm burrowing into the skull. In the beginning, there was silence. Then that thump. Then Wu-Tang is here forever as swerving swallows raptured in old Dirty's voice. Yeah, old Dirty Bastard, AKA Dirt McGurk, AKA Asan Unique, ODB, the specialist, the dead one. Thank you.